Okay, guys. Uh, I hope you had fun with Travis on Monday. So he told me, he told me that you'd be nice to him. So um, I'm glad that it all worked out. Uh, needless to say, everything that Travis was talking about is relevant for this exam. I mean, exactly the same way as all the lectures that I give are relevant for the exam. Um, only the caveat though, you know, the recording on Monday didn't work out. Travis was so sorry about that. But you know, let's face it, truth is sometimes that happens. Yeah? When you stand here, especially when you do this for the first time, you stand here in front of lots of people, one of the last things you worry about is the recording. Yeah? And afterwards you regret it. So I'm afraid there's no recording for the last section. But nevertheless, the topic is exam relevant. What I might going to do is I'm going to put a link to a lecture, to a similar lecture that I've given last year which covers similar content for you to, um, to pick up. Okay, another announcement. How exciting is it? Easter is around the corner, so it's going to happen. So I actually need to be reminded about these things, seriously, otherwise I show up. Yeah. So uh, that's sort of why I want to remind you guys about it. On Monday, there's going to be no lecture. Yeah? On Monday, it's Easter Monday. So after this lecture, you won't see me for a week. So we'll see you again on each other on Wednesday next week. But you know, that's an opportunity for all these I work very useful. This would be the opportunity to catch up on the readings. Yeah, I can't emphasize this enough. The readings are relevant for the exam. There's a reason why I'm putting up all these kind of things and why you have easy access to everything. So use the time to catch up on the readings. Okay, so this is the kind of stuff that I want to talk about today. So Travis told me he started to talk about probability something a little bit. I'm going to follow up on that. So this is where I'm going to jump in. But then I also want to talk a little more about what we call the sampling distribution and what the point of that all is. And then I want to finish off with two smaller points. One about selection bias and the other one about randomness or about finding patterns when there actually are none. Okay, so Keep in mind where we started, you know, last week we talked about uh, qualitative interviews, ethnographies, and these kind of things. It's very much about going, going in deep, yeah? really trying to understand what is actually happening. Hopefully you got that with that kind of approach, you cannot really generalize. And you cannot say something about the population at large, about the young generation in the islands, about people in certain groups. Qualitative research is not good for that. It's not designed for that. It's not the idea of it. Yeah? So a big mistake that you can do is do either the one and say, well, dig in deep, you use, use qualitative research and generalize from that. That's, that's just wrong. You cannot do that. Or to go the other way around as well, like having large samples and saying, you know exactly what's happening down there. It's about combining these different research strategies. So now we're talking about, okay, how do we generalize to a population? Yeah? How can we say something about uh, about a population at large. And, you know, in the ideal world, in the ideal world, we would, we would uh, get data from every person in that population. That would be the ideal world scenario. And oh, it's not impossible. So I remember, you know, when I was, before I came here, I was in Sweden, and there, one thing about Sweden and social sciences is that it's a researcher's paradise because you have data on public records public registers about everybody who ever lived in Sweden in the last 30 years. So I had my hands on everybody who ever lived in the last 30 years. In my data set, there was even the king of Sweden. He had this entry here line about his salary and all these kinds of things. Another thing where you have that more and more is now when we're talking about big data. I didn't have a chance to talk to you about that. I was going to, to talk about that in the second part on International Women's Day. But then we did other things, more important things, but uh, big data is now a way. Nowadays, there's so much data out there where we leave traces behind that actually we do have data about almost everybody. Yeah, so this is a, a new challenge to it. But still, in a lot of social science settings, we don't have that luxury. We don't have the luxury that we get our hands on data on everybody. So what do we do? Well, this is sort of where sampling comes into play. Now, sampling, we select a certain view, and then based on that, we try to generalize to the, to the population. Okay, this is sort of the stuff that Travis talked about. You know, ideally, well, you start off with who do I want to generalize about at the end of the day? Now, that's very important to keep in mind because only, only that is the group that you can say something about. <coughs> so you define a population. Could be, let's say, all students at UCD. 
Yeah, that could be that would be my population that I ultimately want to generalize to. And the sampling frame, the sampling frame is essentially a list of the people in your population. Ideally. Yeah, ideally I would have a list with all students registered at UCD or registered for this course. In practice, the sampling frame and the population don't always align with each other. Even for this course. You now I have a registration list of who's registered for this course. People drop out, other people join in. Some other folks are just lost. Yeah? You don't know where they went. Yeah? Some people are here and they shouldn't be here. So you see that the, that the sampling frame is not necessarily the population that you have, but ideally you would want to get as closely as possible. You want to have a list so that based on that list, you actually then choose the people that you put into your sample, yeah? that you kind of select a few. And then there are different procedures about that. And in general, there are two two different kinds of procedures here. One, and that's what Travis talked about on Monday, it's what we call non-probability sampling. And the other one is called probability sampling. In non-probability sampling, the key is, or the, 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 the point is, that you don't really know the probability for a certain individual to end up in your sample. And that could be because you're just, I don't know, you're lazy, you're sitting around, you're waiting for people to walk by, but that's not a good sampling. That's actually a really bad sampling because you don't know what is the chance that somebody walks by. So you, uh, you and, and sometimes people have difficulties with that. Sometimes people think that, okay, you just need to go large. Let's have a large sample. Yeah? And then this solves all the problems. A little story, you know, we were involved in this project with RTE. Actually, they're going to, to, to have a documentary about, about us. Where, where we are going to be on television as well, actually. So a bunch of colleagues of mine and me. And, uh, um, and there, you know, they did a large survey last year about the young generation in Ireland. And they just wanted to have more and more participants. But they didn't have a sampling frame. And if there's no sampling frame, there's no way for me to generalize what the population actually is. Because it could be a certain kinds of people that end up in this survey without being systematic and selecting people into that sample. So that's sort of like the idea, that's sort of like the point why this non-probability sampling, well sometimes, I don't know, the situation requires it, but uh, these non-probability samplings are actually not that good. They're not that good to make generalizations. So now this is sort of where probability sampling procedures come into play. And the key here is by knowing the probability of how likely somebody is to end up in your sample, yeah? Knowing the problem, if you have a whole list of people who are in the population and then you basically know, let's say you choose 100 people, then you know the probability for a person to end up in your sample that you select and then you, I don't know, interview that person or you give them a questionnaire or whatever. By knowing that probability, you can actually deal with the error that you're making because you are not looking at the whole population. So that's sort of like the thing. So when you are, have a probability sample, you can deal with the mistake that you're making for not collecting information about the whole population. Okay, so the basic difference from non-probability to probability sampling here is that in probability sampling, each member of the sampling frame has a known, non-zero probability of being selected. And you say, hang on, isn't that very straightforward? I just randomly pick one person, you know, by, yeah, out of that list. And actually, yeah, that's sort of the simple random sampling. That's sort of like the most straightforward way of doing this. If you know, okay, everybody in that list has like the same probability, or you actually know the probability, and then you can adjust for that, and then you randomly pick people with a certain probability. But as you'll see, there are other forms of uh, doing that as well. So I'm going to briefly talk about these kind of things. Okay, simple random sampling. I think this is sort of where Travis left it with you or he told me that he introduced and started talking about that. It's really just picking people at random. Yeah. Practically how it works, you, know, you can go like this, you can give everybody, I can give everybody in the room a number, one, two, five hundred, then I have a little hat, you know, and there's sort of one to five hundred numbers, and I randomly pick a number, and if I choose your number, you're part of my sample. And then I do whatever. Have you participated in a study or something like that? Yeah? That would be random sampling. So, 
actually I could even generate random numbers, you know, and then kind of say, okay, whoever has number two, whoever has number 10, whoever has number five, please come forward, you're part of my sample. Okay, um, what are advantages of this kind of approach? Well, I need to know very little about you. you know? All I need to know is sort of like, okay, how many people are here in the room? And then I can generate random numbers based on that. So I don't need to know a lot. I don't need to know anything about any characteristics in your group. You know? If I randomly pick, I should get a representation of the people. And as you will see, I might get slightly things in a different way. So I don't know, one, one try, let's say I pick 10 out of the people here in that room. It's equally possible that all 10 are male. It's possible. Yeah. It's just by chance. If I randomly select 10 people, so it doesn't have to be like, okay, there has to be like a split, but it's just by chance. But if I would keep doing that, if I would pick 10 people and then another 10 people and then another 10 people and then another 10 people, at some point, actually I will get, if I aggregate results, I will get a 50-50 split, most likely, if, let's say, the generation here is one-to-one. -one. Uh, okay, disadvantages. Um, well, you could say, some people say it doesn't use the researcher's expertise, so, you know, but maybe my expertise is not that great, so maybe that's sort of a good thing. Um, it could be that people are so sort of clustered together, but let me, let me push ahead with that. Okay, let me talk about systematic sampling now. Systematic sampling is actually very similar to what I just talked about, but the process is slightly, slightly different to get there. Yeah? It's basically this idea, I select every case person. Yeah? Let's say I have you start counting from one to 500, whatever, you start counting, and then I say, okay, every 10th person stands up. So instead of me generating a list with random numbers and then saying, okay, person number two, person number five, person, I don't know, 150, please stand up, it would be every 10th person stand up. So here you see the example, you know, like people are sort of lined up, you know, they have, have certain numbers and then in this case it would be every 10th person. Well, actually, you know, if the order the way you're sitting here, for example, or in the, the way I order those people and give them, give them the numbers is random to begin with. Yeah? If there's no, no systematic why or bias, people have a higher or a lower number that I assign them uh, to that, then this is actually identical to random sampling. Because then it's, it's more or less like the randomization is happening in the same, at the, uh, in the same way. However, if the order is, um, if the order is according to certain attributes, let's say you would sit here according to your GPA. Yeah? People with the highest GPA sit at the front, people with the lowest GPA sit at the back. Or maybe it's the other way around, I don't know. Yeah? Uh, or any other attributes, age, or shoe size, I don't know. Yeah? If there would be any of those attributes that kind of affects the ordering here, you could say, hang on, then people are clustered together. Then maybe, I don't know, the, the certain people, the younger people sit at the back while the, while the more mature people sit at the, at the front. And think, hang on, so if I have a clustering like that, choosing every 10th person yeah, makes me step over those clusters. So I don't end up, I don't end up with, by chance, 10 people who all have the same attributes. Which is what could easily, which is what could happen in the simple random sampling. You know, as I just said earlier, I could end up by chance with ten <coughs> male students or with ten female students. You know, and with this, uh, with this um, uh, systematic sampling, you know, I don't know, we can talk about the sampling interval, but it's basically the population that you have and how big you want your sample to be, and then it's basically every case every case person, in this case it would be every third, it would be every tenth or whatnot. So that's the sampling inter interval. Okay, so let me move on and now let me talk about stratified sampling. Stratified sampling. Um, stratified sampling, what you do there is basically the entire population is divided into different subgroups or strata. Strata, what is a strata? Could be a social class, 
for the background, you know, the high class and low class education, education level, or it could even be regional differences, you know, people from certain regions. And, uh, and then, so after you've done that, then, the, then you select people out of those different subgroups, let's say out of those social class, of the highest class, of the lowest class, and from that education group, from that education group, or maybe from that region and from that region, then you select, then you select your subjects uh, um, out of these strata through random or through semantic sampling. Okay, to give you an example for this. Um, basically, you know, I'm, I'm involved currently in a study where we actually did stratified sampling. It's a study that I do with a, with a PhD student about how people present themselves on this online dating site. Yeah, it would be even funnier if you would know which online dating site it is. Uh, because we have a research account and we're looking into that. And uh, our hypothesis is that people in cities present themselves differently than people in rural areas, in small villages. Yeah, just the way they present themselves. At the end, we're looking at profile pictures, actually. And uh, we're doing this in the US. So we have this cool little app, you know, we actually fake GPS coordinates and we log into this app and kind of pretend to be somewhere in Alaska or we pretend to be somewhere in New York or we pretend to be somewhere in Florida and so on. And then we collect the data from there about how people present themselves. And then we link it with all sorts of other information, you know, about how many people live in these neighborhoods or in these, uh, in these counties. We're looking at counties actually. And, uh, or other information that we have, we're looking at election results. It's a very interesting topic, you know? Where the people with more, I don't know, in more conservative areas present themselves differently online. So how did we go about this? Ultimately, we wanted to have, you know, our unit of analysis, in this case, are counties. A bit like in, in Ireland, but in the States, you have around 3,500 counties. They're ranging in size from the smallest one having, I think, five to 10,000 people, and the biggest one, the biggest one, I think, is New York, one of the in New York or LA, which has like five or six million people. And it's like a region, yeah? small little region. So what we wanted to do, we want to have a proper representation of large cities and small cities. So we have three and a half thousand counties, and we need to select some out of them. We cannot go and collect data on each one of them. It's impossible, it's too much work. We can't do it. So we said, okay, let's select 200. Let's select 200 and then put a fake GPS coordinate for those 200 together and collect, look into the site and collect the data and so on. Yeah. How do we choose these 200? This is sort of where now sampling comes into play. And because we wanted to have, we wanted to have, a, we don't want to end up where all 200 are sort of the like big cities. Or we don't want to end up where the 200 that we select are all small cities, small villages. Because our whole research question is about the difference between urban and rural areas. So we want to have a, a random sample. At the same time, we want to guarantee that we have representatives for each of these groups. So now what we could do, and you know, Travis talked about the last time, we could do quota sampling. Quota sampling and say, okay, let's, buy, let's find 100 big cities and 100 small cities. But that would be non probability sampling, if we would just select whatever comes to our minds, in a way. The difference between quota sampling and stratified sampling is that within the strata, in stratified sampling, you're still using a probability sampling approach. So that within these things, so basically what we did, we ended up, we ended up dividing uh, all those county, counties according to four different sizes of groups, or like I think it was zero to 10,000, 10,000 to 100,000, 100,000 to a million, and more than a million people living in there. So we had classified all those three and a half thousand counties into that. And then we randomly picked counties from each one of those strata. So that's stratified something. And uh, here you see now the example of how you could, could do this. Uh, now here, you know, it's stratified by gender. So you could actually sort them. Uh, this would be like one, of, one way of, I don't know, I could basically light up my three and a half thousand counties according to size, sort them, and then I choose every tenth, I don't know, every thirtieth, thirtieth county. And then I would end up with an equal amount of uh, people in these different, different strata that I want. 
So the idea here is sort people according to their strata, whatever that is, social class, <coughs> education, or in our case, it's agglomeration size of those counties, and, uh, and then we do simple random sampling within those strata according to the proportion of how, group, how, how large that group is. So it's a bit like quarter sampling, and sometimes people have difficulty distinguishing these two, but the key is that for stratified sampling, you use a probability sampling approach within the strata. That's sort of the key. Okay, um, what are advantages and disadvantages of this? Well, it assures a representation of all groups in the sample. And maybe now you see that, because you know, I'm going out there, and actually now, luckily, I have an intern that collects the data, but still it's an awful amount of work to go and log in to this app and collect the data and check out, I don't know, how people are presenting themselves online and so on. It's a lot of work. And if for whatever, if you would just have chosen a random sample of the counties, it could happen, it could happen that we just ended up with the 100 smallest counties. And our whole research question wouldn't work because we wouldn't have representation for all groups, for all those agglomeration sizes of the counties. So this approach guarantees that, while at the same time, you can still, you can still do everything that, that we do with probability samples. Well, some disadvantages require some information about how big are these different strata. You know, sometimes you don't know. In our case, actually, we do know, because we have a, actually a very good list. There are just 3,500 counties in the US. I have the exact list. Actually, I have the exact data, how many uh, of them are there, and how many would fall into the different, different groups. So I can adjust how many I select from that group accordingly. But this can be costly, you know, if you don't have that information. Okay, let me move on and talk briefly about cluster sampling. So cluster sampling is, you know, these things might always sound familiar, yeah? but, uh, but there are nuances in there. It's important to know these nuances uh, beyond non-probability probability sampling. Often these nuances are related to practical issues. Yeah? So uh, cluster sampling is a way to reduce costs as well, when you don't have when you don't have a complete list of everybody, yeah? if you just can't afford to do that, or for practical reasons you cannot set it up. Yeah? So cluster sampling would be a way where you first sample natural groups, let's say certain neighborhoods, certain city blocks. Instead of kind of sampling directly, let's say I want to do a survey about I don't know people in Dublin, instead of having my whole list of everybody who lives in Dublin. I basically start off with a list of streets, or maybe with a list of city blocks, or with a list of neighborhoods. I randomly pick, I don't know, five, ten, whatever, how many streets, how many neighborhoods, and then within, within those, that's what we call a cluster, within those cluster, I then create the list of everybody who lives there, and then I use, I don't know, random sampling or systematic sampling to get there. Yeah. But the idea is that you first pick naturally occurring clusters, and then uh, within that clusters, you can then go on and choose more. So this would be like a one-stage cluster sampling. I just pick randomly, I don't know, certain, certain neighborhoods in Dublin, and, uh, and then I include everybody in that neighborhood into my survey. That would be a one-stage cluster sampling. A two-stage cluster sampling, and when you have cluster sampling, often you have a two-stage cluster sampling. I would first randomly pick neighborhoods in Dublin, and then for each one of those neighborhoods, I would then generate the list of everybody who lives there, and then I select the people from that list. And maybe you see the big, uh, the big advantage is here that I don't have to create that list for everybody in Dublin. I only have to create that list for, the, for those clusters, for those neighborhoods that I select. So that's, that's cluster sampling. Uh, it can be used when a whole list of a population is, uh, is difficult or costly to obtain. Okay, so these are different strategies for, for sampling. You know, then we get data and then we want to generalize based on that data. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about sampling distribution because I want you to understand what's actually happening here and how we actually generalize from these kind of things. So what are the things that I need to consider when, I'm, when I cannot include everybody in my study? You know? So by just having that sample, and maybe then you understand why probability samplings are advantageous. 
Okay, so let me talk about sampling distribution. So a little example. You mentioned there are 10 people, there are 10 people and they own different money. You know, now it goes from zero to zero to nine. So yeah, every number is represented once. Yeah. So in this case, by the way, this is an example I have from Babby, and it's one of the textbooks that I'm using here. Um, so every person is every every number is represented once. This is now my whole population. This is my whole population. Okay, now let's we can go and draw a sample from that. That means we don't we don't in this case now we, we just know what their what their what their, 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 their money is that they have, and we actually we know the average as well. Now we have like uh, like uh, ten representations from zero to nine, so the true average is four point five. That's the true average. We know that. That's now in the population. Now I'm going to demonstrate you what we will think what it is when we sample. Okay, the simple sample that you could do in a situation like this, you just sample one. Sample one person out of those ten. And now in this case, I could have randomly selected that guy who happens to have half eight dollars in this example. So if this is, would be all what I see, and I would generalize to the whole population from that, what would I think about what the average money for the whole population is? Well, I would think it's eight. Yeah? Because this is sort of now what my sample would tell me. If I would have drawn another sample, I could have equally drawn this person here who has six uh, dollars. If I would have ended up with that, I would have thought that everybody in the population, or you know, the mean in the population is six. Right. If I would have done this, you know, this is a person who has zero money, yeah? I would have thought that everybody, or the average for the whole population is zero. Now this is now the sample that I'm selecting, and you know, I can, can look at the average in my sample, and then I draw a conclusion for that for the population. Okay, so this is sort of now what, if I would have gone on, you know, I can see that there are 10 possible samples that I can choose of size 1. So we have the true mean of 4.5, but I could have, I could have, and actually in this case, each one of them is equally likely to have drawn. If I would just give me the task, choose whatever 10% out of that population of 10 people, that's one person, I could have ended up with each one of these values, and that's what I would have thought what the generation, what the whole whole population looks like. Okay. Now let's move on. Let's move one step further. What if I would draw a sample with two people? Now instead of one person, I choose two people. And then based on these two people, I look at the average, you know, what is sort of like the, the average money that they have. And based on that, I draw a conclusion about the population. Okay, one example. I could have ended up with these two in my sample, eight and nine. So if that would have been my sample, I would have thought, okay, well, the average is 8.5. Uh, the total average in the population, based on that, if that would be all that I see, I would think it's 8.5. I could have ended up with something like this, you know, with a person who has zero money and the other person who has six dollars in this case. Based on that, I would have concluded that the average in the population is three. Or I could have ended up with something like this, uh, two and seven. Based on that, I would have thought that the average in the population is 4.5. So hopefully now you see that kind of by just making a random selection of the people, you will necessarily get a distribution around what the true value for the population is. Because you're not including everybody. So in the same way as I showed you that when you have, when you, when you, when you, when you have 10 people in your whole population and you, you draw a sample of exactly one, there are 10 different samples that you could draw, right? You've got 10 different samples that you could draw. In this case, when I draw two people out of that, well, actually, there are 45 different combinations that I could have drawn. So there are 45 different possibilities of combinations that I could have gotten. With then an average value, as I just showed you. Yeah. And finally, you know, actually this is how it looks like. And maybe to make clear what that means. So in this case, we have, you know, this is the estimated mean. This is sort of what I would think what the population mean would be, the population average, based on my sample. Yeah. 
And on the other axis, you see how many samples would give me that result. So how many combinations of two people collect, picking two people, would give me that result. So in this case, it means I have two samples that would give me an average of 1.5. What are these two samples? Well, actually, it's this one. Now, I could have chosen a person who has zero money and a person who has three dollars. That gives me an average of 1.5. But I could have also chosen, by chance, a person with one dollar and the other person with two dollars. would have also given me an average of 1.5. So this is sort of where these two samples come from. There's no other possibilities. I could have gotten that average. It just doesn't work, you know? When you have like seven and eight, it's not 1.5. If you would have four and nine, it's not 1.5. If you would have zero and five, it's not 1.5. So there are just two possibilities how I could have ended up with that then. Right? And there you see, actually, for the true me, there are most possibilities that I can end up with. And now if I would go on, so now I showed you that just for picking two out of 10. What if I would go on and pick three out of 10 or four out of 10? or five out of 10, how would that then look like? And actually, this is what we call now the sampling distribution. And now you see the more people that I pick, the last one would be like a sample of six. You see, I'm actually, the average guess is going to be pretty good. I know the true mean is 4.5 anyway, and for most samples that I will pick, I will end up with the true average mean. There's still a possibility that I could end up with a with guess of 2.5 here if I draw six people. But it's very unlikely. There's just one sample that would give me that. It would be zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Yeah. Perhaps it is three, not there. Okay, so this is the sampling distribution. And you know, I don't want to spend too much more time on this, but kind of there's a really nice thing about it is that uh, in the second year, Owen is probably going to talk about that. Uh, when you when you have a, a population in your distribution, you, uh, you don't even know how something is distributed in your, in your real population. Uh, how many people, I don't know, have a certain amount of money or whatnot. If you draw samples, the distribution of what you get in the sample will eventually follow a normal distribution. It's really freaky, but that's how it's called central limit theory. But I just demonstrated it to you, you know, like how this thing kind of evolves, this thing again. So if I would start, actually we started from a, we call that a uniform distribution. There's just one person with a certain, there's no more person that have more money than others. That's a uniform distribution. But still we end up with a normal distribution for the mean. But I don't want to talk too much about it. I don't want to open that up. You know, I just want to flag it here. Uh, the nice thing about that is that we can deal with the error that we are making when we are sampling. Now there's a certain chance that my sample will give me an average of 1.5. That's a certain chance if I select two out of 10. But the chance is very low. Yeah? Well, actually, I can calculate that chance. Anyway, you don't need to know too more about the central limit theorem. I just wanted to mention it here, nevertheless. You know, so, because it comes up later on at some point, and then you wonder, what the hell is this? Yeah? And then, I don't know, it's actually uh, sometimes important to have the intuition for this already. Okay, but let me never let's talk about these three things very briefly. As I mentioned, when we are sampling, there's a good chance that I don't end up directly on the spot. Yeah? There's a, I, I could, I don't know, have a sample being drawn, I randomly select my sample, and I, I would say the average uh, uh, money they have is 1.5, but actually the true average in the whole population is 4.5. So the mistake that I'm making here is called sampling error because you're not collecting data from the whole population, because you have a sample, you're, there's a chance that the average that you get from your sample is not the real one. Yeah. And actually with the distribution, it actually you can calculate what the chance is that it's not the real one. You get an idea about that. So it's something to keep in mind. You know, even when you collect a sample, you go out and you say, OK, well, this is sort of what my sample says. This is the average. You need to be aware, hang on, actually it could have been that just even if I just applied a random sample, that I ended up with a certain kind of people in that sample. Yeah. And that whatever I'm concluding based on that sample, it's so wrong. No, it doesn't have to be one-on-one -on -one match. It's, there's no guarantee that you end up with an average of 4.5 in every sample that you're drawing. Some of them you will, actually for most of them you will, but for some of them you will end up with a higher or for the other ones with a lower guess for that whole thing. So when you sample, you make an error. And we call that the sampling error. 
Okay, then there's a confidence interval. Confidence interval is basically uh, uh, your confidence to, for the results to be within a certain range, certain amount of, with a certain probability. But um, let me move on. I don't want to talk too much about this. Okay, because what I want to talk about is selection. I want to talk to you briefly about selection. So I have little, little, little uh, uh, quizzy here. So please take out your whatever and answer the question. Okay, is this, is this a good question? What is the problem with this question? Obviously you have one. Who are the two who don't have three? Who don't have one? Uh, so, yeah. So, <laughs> they are like, why do you use your computer or whatnot? Yeah? But this is, this is a classic example of a selection bias. Because the people that don't have a smartphone, well, they don't take the survey. Yeah? Because you take it with your phone. And that's sort of like a phenomena that actually you need to keep in mind when you when you when you do research because it can happen it can happen all over. Yeah? It can happen all over. An example that I want to give you this is a really nice little story. Uh, some statisticians involved. You know, like the story goes. Well, it's actually true. Real story. Uh, during the Second World War, you know, like British and American bomber, they they bombed Germany, and uh, and then they flew back to Britain where they were based, and uh, a lot of them had bullet holes. Yeah, from the from the, the German anti-aircraft uh, uh, guns, yeah, from from the ground they shot them, and they came back with those bullet holes. And you know, and at the time they actually they looked at the data, so they actually drew a little map. This is sort of how it looked like. This was sort of like these kind of planes, sort of like the Spitfire, and the dots now stand for the bullet holes that they got. And then they thought, okay, well we should uh, maybe we should reinforce the plating of those aircrafts. And that was the idea. How can we make those planes better protected from those bullet holes? And the, the original thought was, okay, well, this is sort of the data that we get, right? So um, let's protect the areas where we have the most bullet holes. Uh, is that a good idea? Is that a good idea? Well, actually, there's a statistician who came along. It was Ward, uh, or Walt, he's a famous statistician. He said, guys, you can't do that. That's completely stupid. You should protect the areas where there are no bullet holes. Why? Because these aircrafts don't make it back. They crash. The ones with the bullet holes, they are the ones that actually make it back. This is selection effect. Yeah. This is selection effect that if you would just take the data of the aircrafts that come back, we have a selective sample of those that actually were hit in such a way that we could actually drive back. By the ones that were hit so hard, and actually the funny thing is it's sort of like the fuselage thing. Oh, great, the fuselage, we don't need to protect the fuselage because there are no bullet holes. Well, there were bullet holes, but those aircraft, they just exploded, yeah. so they didn't come back. And in the literature, we also call this survivor bias. Yeah. Survivor bias, um, that sometimes when you look, let's say, you look at another famous example, you look at uh, smoking among very old people. You look at health outcomes. Yeah, they, well, actually, the data is like that. You know, very old people, 80, 80 year old, 90 year old people, they are equally healthy people who smoke, who smoke their whole life, and people who didn't smoke. Why is that? Similar logic. Well, probably most smokers died earlier. Huh? They didn't survive until that point. So they don't end up in your sample. 
So that's sort of like the kind of things that you need to think about. And there can be self-selection into a sample as well. Uh, so if let's say I have a sample, I, I want to do a study about um, I don't know people about volunteering. Yeah. What is a big problem? That most likely people who think volunteering is great, they are more likely to volunteer to participate in my survey. Yeah. People who think this is a bad idea, they don't volunteer. They don't. Why? They are less likely to volunteer for the survey because they don't like to volunteer. So let's selection selection bias. Let me briefly talk about another thing uh, in the context of samples, about randomness, uh, because sometimes. By chance, as I just told you, sometimes by chance we find patterns, but it's driven by randomness. So this is all randomness. Uh, this is a random picture. An example that there is, uh, actually there's a little, little uh, interesting book about, um, I don't know, an, an intro stats book where I found this, a blaster in the donut, that, uh, you know, they installed telecommunication masts for mobile phones. You know, this is sort of how it goes. It's like the, the, the sending tower. And, uh, and there's this one community in the UK somewhere where people were just, you know, this was the beginning, you know, 2003, you have to imagine, this is sort of like the first telecommunication mass being built and so on. People didn't really know, what does it do to my health? I don't know, am I more likely to get cancer because of this? They just didn't really know you know, at the time. And uh, there was this one village in the, in the UK where uh, people were, were, uh, were violent against this telecommunication mast. They, uh, you know, they protested against it, they kind of torn it down. And why was it? Because there were 20 households within 500 meters were people who had gotten cancer. Yeah. You think, oh, okay, well, this is obviously a relationship there, you would think. You would think, no, that's a telecommunication mask. And there are sort of like lots of people with cancer in the neighborhood. Well, the thing is, if you kind of randomly would have assigned people, or if you would, if people would, if they, wouldn't be anything other than just pure chance, and actually this research shows that, that often it is pure chance, whether people get cancer or not. If it would be complete chance, actually it would be very unlikely, but there would be some cases where it would cluster together. Like as I mentioned earlier, if I would draw 10 people out of this class, there's a very small chance that I would draw 10 males, or that I would draw 10 females. Or even if you place a lot of, actually it has the same chance that it would draw one, two, three, four, five, six, or so has the same chance as any other combination. It's the same chance as any other combination, but people don't do it because they don't understand that, that, hang on, if there's one, two, three, four, five, six in the number, there must be a reason this is sort of like, yeah. And the same thing in this case, if we would look at all the telecommunication masks in the UK and all the people that have cancer around it in a way, this was completely within the expected cost rate by pure random allocation. So sometimes, uh, there are patterns, and that's sort of our problem because we are meaning making machines. We are meaning making machines. This is sort of how our brain evolves. We see something, we try to make sense out of it. Yeah? But sometimes it doesn't make sense. Or sometimes it's just pure chance. But our brain is sort of trained to f identify that pattern. Yeah? But randomization, or a pure random process, and that's something that I wanted to, uh, uh, to get across here, pure randomization can generate something that looks like a pattern, but it's still the outcome of the random process. However, if then you would go on and collect more samples and more samples and so on, you would get what I told you earlier about the sampling distribution, you know, then you would get to that point. But there's still a small chance that you would give a sample where, I don't know, uh, a, certain, a, certain, a certain pattern is there. Anyway, so much for today. So catch up on the readings and next week we'll talk a little bit about data analysis and see you next time.